All right, welcome everybody. It is Tuesday, May 11th, 2021 at 7.02 p.m. And I will call to order the Ross Valley School District Board of Trustees regular meeting. Our uh, first order on the agenda is to do the Pledge of Allegiance. So for everyone who would like to join in the Pledge of Allegiance, go ahead and unmute yourself. And on the count of three, we can start. One, two, three. Pledge okay. allegiance, allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of, America of America and to and the to Republic, Republic for which, for which it, it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Okay. We have a fairly uh, small agenda tonight, but if there are any amendments to the agenda from any other trustees, now's the time to say it. Yes, no, nope, I don't see any, I haven't heard any, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, entertain a motion to approve the, or to adopt the agenda and the time allocations. So moved, Ryan. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, and we'll take a vote, Ryan. Aye. Wesley? Aye. Marie? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Shelley? Aye. All right, so we've adopted our agenda and our time allocations, and we will move on to communication. Marcy, are there any public comments regarding items on or not on the agenda? No, they are not. Okay. And board announcements. Anybody have any updates or announcements from the board? None from Wesley. Okay, joke. No. Um, and then I don't have any. Ryan doesn't sound like you've got any. And then correspondence. I don't believe we have any other correspondence, do we either, Marcy? We, we do not, no. Okay. So we don't have any other correspondence. So we can move right on to the presentations. And our first presentation is discussion number 17. Presentation number 17, we're up to 17 on COVID-19 schools reopening. And so we, I know we're all looking forward to hearing how things are going in our reopening and getting an update. Great, thank you so much. All right, and now as we are focusing on our reopening, we're um, setting our sights into the 21-22 school year. So that now is gonna be the focus um, of our school's reopening updates going forward. So number 17 takes us into the future. And so tonight we have with us in this presentation, um, Maria Lubomirsky, Assistant Principal at White Hill, uh, Eric Sable, our Director of Student Services, Julia Wolcott, Director of CNI, and myself, Superintendent. All righty, and um, Marin remains in the orange tier. Over the last couple of weeks, we have teetered into the yellow tier, but we just haven't been able to solidly get into that tier or the level one or the minimal tier. Um, but we keep trying. And so we're gonna just hope that soon Marin County will join San Francisco and be able to go into tier one. Um, we're still monitoring the Marin County Schools dashboard, which provides information related to all schools, public and private independent schools in Marin County. And this was the last updated on May 7th. Across Marin, all 100, or 100%, I mean, of schools are open with 90% of schools being open in person uh, fully. According to the figures maintained by Marin uh, County Public Health and MCOE, there have been 12 cases of transmission, uh, suspected school transmission, and this is up one from our last update that we did on at the May, sorry, April 13th board meeting. And uh, these are of course been maintained since September 8 when the first schools in Marin County uh, reopened to in-person instruction. And of those suspected in school transmission, seven were student to student. That's one up from our April 13th meeting. And three of those were adult to adult and two were adult to student. And there still have been zero student to adult transmissions in schools. And in RBSD, we are still maintaining our dashboard and it's updated whenever there is a scenario two or scenario three um, situation that goes on. And so it was last updated uh, yesterday. And we have approximately 87% of our students currently attending school in person. Um, now our numbers haven't changed except for at White Hill where we have seen an up uptick 
uh, seven in uh, seven scenario two incidences have occurred since our last board meeting on April 13th. And um, we still only have one suspected in school transmission that would have been from student to student. And in Ross Valley, we still have no incidences of transmission from student to staff, staff to student, or staff to staff on any of our school, sorry, I already said that, uh, staff to students on any of our school or at our district office sites. So what we can see from the data across the county, as well as in our own district, the schools are just not where the transmissions of COVID are occurring in our communities. It is really a community-based transmission. Any questions before we go to the next slide? All good. Okay, great. And Julie is going to take it from here. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I wanted to share with all of you an article that we have been reading and rereading, and it's kind of helping us to set the direction as we move forward in Ross Valley um, into our summer school planning that you'll learn about later this evening and into opening next year. Um, and this is from Linda Darling Hammond, who is the California State Board of Education president and also the president of the Learning Policy Institute and basically an all around education superhero. She is quite a thinker and someone that, um, that, that really helps in terms of setting, setting the pace and setting the tone. Um, and I like this image that I included here because the, um, the conversation that we are having is about accelerating instruction and um, what is meant by accelerating instruction is really helping students who have experienced some um, unfinished learning to catch up and to enter into their grade level meeting grade level standards, but helping to give them kind of that boost um, and also giving a boost to any child um, moving forward. And there's a recognition in this image that accelerating learning can look like speeding up. It can also look like slowing down or changing directions, depending on what it is that you're teaching and who the kid is and, and what it is that they need. Um, so these are some points from the article that um, we read as an administrative team. Um, we shared this with superintendent's council. Um, many of our staffs have taken a look um, at this article as well. Um, and this, this forward thinking takes us to um, beyond COVID and really aiming for reinvention. So we are all having that conversation about what can we learn from this tremendously difficult time um, and what can we carry forward and how can we rebuild and reinvent to kind of a new normal. Um, and so these first points here are just things that we know about learning and about how students learn. What we know is that absolutely primary are the positive relationships and attachments um, that students have with each other and with the adults on campus. Um, and that those relationships are what enable our students um, to develop resilience from trauma. Um, we also know that children actively construct knowledge by connecting what they know to what they are learning within their cultural context. So really this speaks to the importance of us knowing our students well and meeting them where they are and allowing them to make connections to their own lives. Um, we know that learning is social, emotional, and academic, and that children learn best when they are safe, affirmed, and deeply engaged within a supportive community of learners. We also know that learning is enhanced by physical activity, joy, and opportunities for self-expression. So all of our focus on the arts in the Ross Valley School District are really robust um, in engaging visual arts and music and theater programs are all aspects of learning that are going to be especially important for our students as we move forward. Um, also, super important is the understanding that students' perceptions of their own ability influence learning. Um, and I kind of can't understate how, how, I can't overstate how incredibly important this is. Um, how students view themselves has so much to do 
with how they are able to move forward academically. And that has a lot to do with how we label kids and the importance of not labeling kids. So when we talk about accelerating instruction and moving kids forward where they need to be, rather than remediating, because when you are remediating and you're taking kids backwards, they know what's happening and it actually can do harm to kids in terms certainly of their self-esteem. Um, and we also know that all children are motivated to learn the next set of skills for which they are ready. And few are motivi motivated, this connects to the last statement, by labels that rank them against others or communicate stigma. Um, and it's a big job that we have as educators is to recognize and understand what it means for each child individually to be ready and what it is that they are ready for. So what should a new normal look like? So this is the, the post-pandemic vision of schools. Um, and it, it very much relates to the last couple of slides that we know we want our students to experience warm relationships, social emotional supports. Um, we need to redesign our schools so that they are relationship oriented, re relationship centered um, with time for creating community and trust and belonging among students and families. We also want our kids to be super engaged in and experiencing joy in their learning. And so those, the project-based learning, the hands-on activities, the science, the outdoor play and exercise and the arts and the collaborative activities that they're building together, all the school stuff that kids run home and talk about what was the super, super fun thing that they did at school that day, that's what's best for kids. And we need to make sure that we are um, supporting that level of engagement in our, in our classrooms. And then finally, we need, um, we need to encounter authentic, culturally responsive learning tasks and inquiry projects that are connected to their experiences. Um, that allow them to understand and positively impact their environment. Um, so th again, that's just speaking to knowing who your kids are and where they're coming from and meeting them where they are. Um, assessment is going to be really important moving forward in order for us to understand where kids are. Um, and recently I heard John Hattie, who's another big educational thinker, talking about assessment as a process of discovery. And that's really the process that we as a staff are going to need to engage in, right? This discovery of where are our kids and how can we help just give them that nudge forward to that next step of where they need to go. Understanding that there may be some trauma that we need to address and that we need to meet that trauma with healing and support. Um, and then the acceleration of learning through additional time, all, all the different things that we can do to help give kids that boost, right? More time, high quality tutoring and strategic groups. Um, and then again, those strong relationships and um, customizing teaching really, um, again, it's going back to the relationship and seeing the kids for who they are and where they are and meeting them there. And so, well, let's, before I get started on this, any questions about any of the slides that Julia covered? All good? Okay. Yeah. And all of uh, what Julia covered and what we're um, focusing on tonight is going into the 21-22 school year. And so we are going to be returning to full school days, five days per week. And of course, we will need to consider and plan for whatever state and county requirements and or guidelines will be in place next year. What we're hearing right now is that there will still be an expectation for face coverings as well as some amount of distancing, but by August that could fully change. So whatever uh, comes into play, um, we will be um, adapting or folding it into our planning. Um, and- Marcy, may I just ask a quick question? Absolutely. Uh, are you getting any inquiries whatsoever from the community at all as to whether there's any question as to whether we're going to be fully open in 21, 22? Um, just people are wondering if they haven't heard or they didn't, um, you know, uh, when the previous emails have gone out around our planning for, because I think this is probably the sixth 
board update that we've done where we've talked about a full reopening for next year. Right. Um, and so there, there's a couple of questions that are coming up. The principals are addressing them at their sites um, and or I just respond in the emails, you know, and let, let folks know that, yes, it's a full return uh, next school year. I've talked to a couple of parents. So, um, yeah, so I think everybody is hearing that and as um, new students are registering into our schools or maybe students who've left us are re-registering to attend next year, the administrative assistance at the school sites are covering it there. Um, and it's on our registration page. It's, you know, it's, it's on our website as well. So um, we'll just keep getting the word out and making sure that all of our families know full return. Woohoo! Yeah, I, I've noticed a down, a down tick in, in those types of questions. I just wanted to inquire as to whether you had seen the same trend. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and so moving on um, into planning for next school year is um, we know that there will be some new one-time fund revenues and that we are using what we know about them um, to determine the academic and social emotional supports needed for our students and determining the allocation of these one-time funds. So here on the screen, this slide shows the different um, areas where the money's coming in. So there's ESSER, there is still learning loss mitigation um, and uh, ELO or extended learning opportunities. And as you can see, that's a nice hefty amount of money. Now, the only aspect of it is that it is one time money. And so um, we need to look to maximize and extend their use as long as possible, while at the same time, not obligating ourselves to any ongoing programs that we develop or implement with these funds that will cause or exacerbate any of our deficit spending into the future. So we are being very strategic as to um, how we are approaching the use of these funds and trying to ensure that we're finding the most effective actions to best meet all of our students' needs, each and every one of our students. So the one area that's highlighted in blue here, the ELO or extending learning opportunity, um, those that particular pot right there does require a board approved plan and also stakeholder input. So we have been gathering stakeholder input and we will continue to do so. Um, our next groups that we'll be focusing on are our um, staff at large as well as our parents at large. And we have done a lot of brainstorming and really utilizing that article that uh, Julia, um, those slides that Julia went through to help us look at what the specific um, needs of our students might be and how we can use the funds. And we know right off the top that, that where it says paraeducator there under the blue section, that right off the top is a requirement of use of the funds is that 10% must be used for paraeducator. So in our district, when we take 10% of the total, that amount comes out to 114,000. And there's a specific education code which requires the, what a parent edu educator would do and would be required to serve um, in our classrooms or in our schools to serve the students. So they're serving as a para educator, a teacher support um, to support the students in the class. And <laughs> go ahead. Marcy, did, does this mean that there's a certain uh, component that is considered or classified as restricted funds? It would be, yes, yeah, within that. So we, we automatically take out that 10% of the total funding for ELO. We set it aside and we know that's how we must use it. And then the balance of the ELO funds is where then we can start to utilize and plan for um, implementing those dollars. Is, is the paraeducator funding a, a minimum? Like, could you spend more than that on paraeducators if you oh, wanted yeah. to? Yeah, okay. that, that is the minimum. Okay, yeah. thanks. And so what we know across the whole entire state is going to be finding paraeducators. And so we are in a teacher shortage. Paraeducators are of the classified service. They don't require a credential. And so when we're looking to um, add more aids onto our school campuses, um, we just hope that even we can fill 114,000 worth of those positions but we know it's use it or lose it. So we're gonna do our very best to make sure that we don't leave any of these dollars unspent. Now, as we also know here, as you can see over on the right-hand side of the, the table is there's a deadline to spend them. So that first pot of money, the 207,000 needs to be spent by September 30th, 2023. 
And then there is these elementary, the ESSER uh, secondary emergency relief funds. And there's a second pot of money, the 382.5. It needs to be spent by September of 24. So as we see, as you go down this list, some of the money, the ELO funds, for example, must be expended by the beginning of the 22-23 school year. And so for us, what we know is that we're looking at not spending all of our dollars in the first or second year, but making them last. Because what we do anticipate is that for some of our students, we may not truly know what the impacts of the pandemic have caused on their learning, their social emotional well-being, and or their mental health. And so for us, we wanna stretch them as long as possible without leaving any dime, uh, any penny left spent by the end of uh, whatever that uh, deadline is. And so with any questions more about that? Okay, so with the ELO, so go ahead, Julie. Um, there are seven supplemental instruction and support strategies. And so kind of we'll just, uh, we've listed them here for you to see the entire language related to each of the seven support strategies. But just to pick out, we need to extend instructional learning time. So one of the ways that we're looking at doing that is by extending or operating summer school. It's been a very long time since summer school except for our extended school year for special education students, but for our general education students or those special ed students who don't have ESY, extended school year written into their IEPs, offering a summer school program. But there could be intersessional, for example. Intersession would be during a break, like midwinter break, winter break, those kinds of things. And then on to the next slide, um, number two, the second strategy is accelerating progress. So how do we accelerate to close those learning gaps? And so here are some listed in the subset of A, B, and C, tutoring or one-on-one -on -one or small group learning supports, learning recovery programs and materials, educator training for both certificated and classified staff. So the approach with this, these seven strategies are not solely focused just on the students, but they're also focused on the staff the teachers, faculty, as well as families to ensure that the whole families uh, are supported in their students, their children's best approach and best um, um, doing well in school. And the third strategy is that we would look at um, integrated student supports to address other barriers to learning like health, counseling or mental health services and programs to address student trauma and social emotional learning and also possible referrals for any support uh, for family or any student needs. Four and five are relatively not applicable to Ross Valley. Um, strategy number four has to do with learning hubs, but because we'll be operating a full school day for five school days next year, this won't be applicable to us. And then number five is credit recovery. And based on how our school system works here in Ross Valley, we don't have any eighth graders in danger of not moving on to high school, but of course supporting them with our summer school program will definitely help any students who are, are, are may not be doing well. Um, but it's really about credit recovery. So it's really ensuring that students who may be in danger of not graduating, for example, from a high school would um, utilize Number five is credit recovery options. So number six, um, we want to ensure additional academic services for diagnostic progress monitoring and benchmark assessments. Number seven, the last one is training for school staff on strategies, including trauma-informed practices. And you may remember from our previous board meetings this year where we talked about our staff development days, professional development days, that trauma-informed practices was something that we've already been working on and implementing in our schools to support our students. But we wanna be sure that we're engaging students and families in addressing this, their students' social, emotional, health, and academic needs. Marcy, <clears throat> quick question. Yep. Do you know if number three includes paying for things like um, health screen screenings? Um, and you had mentioned like we might not know what the impacts of COVID are for you know a while. Um, can you can you pay for health 
other other kinds of diagnostics and screenings under number three that aren't academic related, mm -hmm. you know? That, that would definitely be related. And that's where we would join in with community partnerships mm -hmm. um, in order to um, have students referred to any supports that they might need because their health is critical. If they can't see, right, and then they, they can't read. It's right. very difficult to, to learn. And if their mouth is hurting them because they have dental needs, mm -hmm. then we need to be sure that we're getting them the, those supports. You know, with the pandemic, for um, some of our families, there may very well be, if their families have lost income, they may not have been able to continue on with the services that they um, would normally do for their kids to make sure they're healthy. So yes, mm -hmm. so it's a comprehensive approach to the whole child is mm -hmm. beautiful. And it's the absolute beautiful part about this additional funding. It is absolutely the, the biggest influx of dollars that we probably have ever seen into education. It is just sad that it is short-lived and short-term. In terms of California, we know that our schools are not funded at the high levels that other states are funded. But for right now, we'll take it. We're not gonna turn down um, any possible supports that we might be able to give to our students. Our goal with everything that we're doing in planning for utilization of the funds, as well as moving into next school year is beyond the funding. So how do we ensure that anything and everything that we put into place, we have set the stage for future years? And so how do we ensure that our teachers, our classified employees, our administrators, our families, our students are all set up for success so that they have those tools in their repertoire, in their backpacks that they can pull out and utilize long after any of the one-time dollars are gone. And this is absolutely our opportunity to, as much as you know, people talk about getting back to normal, there is no back to normal. We are going into the future and we're still imagining, reimagining what our schools will look like and how to best serve all of our students. So just like this has been a year, year and a half of reimagining schools, we're not finished yet. We're still going to be building that airplane while we're flying it and really looking at putting in, um, in place and looking at the data and reviewing and analyzing what we do, why we do it, and is it effective? Is it really best meeting our kids and making adjustments along the way? So it's a real um, fantastic time, actually. It's very energizing uh, to be in education and to see about supporting all of our kids and families and staff along the way. Um, so the next slide shows some of the brainstorming that we've been able to do already for the use of the ELO funds. And you'll just see some of the, the themes throughout. Now, one of the questions like that Wesley asked earlier was, what about other funding? You know, there's a lot of other pots of money. Um, we want to be able to utilize um, everything that we're doing to best support our students. So all of the strategies that we're going to use are gonna be interconnected and integrated with each other so that we are seeing that the direction that we're moving is not scattershot, but it is actually directional and it's focused and it's intentional to serve our kids. So some of the things that, you know, for example, here's paraeducators 10%, that just comes right off the top. And so that is the academic support in the staff category. Acceleration and in instructional coaches, intervention teachers. So what we're also wanting to look at is our multi-tier system of support to be able to support all of the students. That's an academic, social, emotional, mental health approach to the whole child. And so where we have our acceleration instructional coaches, those are new positions that we'll have in place. They will be teachers on special assignment, otherwise known as, you know, in education, we have a lot of acronyms, TOSAs, teacher on special assignment. And they will go in and they will support and help with strategies to use to support the students. Intervention teachers. So when the teachers have done what they can in their classrooms to support kids, then the students to have additional intervention supports. We need to increase our English learner support. Right now we have part-time EL teachers and we're looking to increase their time to serve, to serve our English learners. And at White Hill, looking at co-teaching. So part of that coaching or instructional support model is where teachers would actually be co-teaching. 
Uh, guest support teachers, uh, these are our substitutes and how they can support and work in the classrooms to ensure that when our teachers need to be out of the classrooms to support each other and or they may need release time to work with each other and, and help uh, with any strategies used to utilize guest support teachers, um, which are substitutes um, in there. Um, and along the lines of serving our special education students would be that same coaching model. So special education coach, a number of years ago, for those of you who've been in the district a while, you may remember that in addition to our director of student services, we had a coordinator to really get in and support what might be needed with strategies and those kinds of things at the site in the classroom level. And then PD, professional development, accelerated learning strategies. So some of these notion we've, you know, for many years in education been focused on remediation. Well, now our focus is on acceleration and it does look different. It's not the same as remediation. So we do need to provide professional development to support our teachers with that. And then academic support and time. So our summer learning program as school day extension to support students through small group or high impact tutoring. What we don't wanna do is have kids miss regular instruction. So looking at how to provide support to them that doesn't um, replace their first best learning, which is in the classroom with their teachers. And then academic support programs, additional literacy and mathematics programs, um, programs such as Read Naturally, Lexia, Core 5, Imagine Math, and a universal screener. So a universal screener is something that there is a screening that's conducted to identify or predict students who may be at risk for poor learning outcomes. And so there, there are known universal screeners out there and to be able to access and utilize those to better help us. So not to wait till a student's not performing or not doing well, but to use it as predictive in nature. So if there are um, elements related to the screener, then we can get those supports and accelerate that learning sooner. And then benchmark assessment systems. We do have to be able to have data. How is what we're doing working? How do we know? And then if it's not working, what do we try next? And then in the 21-22 school year, a virtual learning academy program. I'm gonna cover that later, so I won't go into detail here with that. And in the wellness side, the BACR, Bay Area Counseling Resources, that's who we have in our elementary schools right now as counselors. And we're looking to contract for more and specifically to have at least one who is bilingual, Spanish speaking, to support our students. And uh, so Eric Sable, our Director of Student Services is working with the BACR leadership to uh, secure additional counselors in our schools. We're also looking at a wellness coordinator. So you see a theme here that we're looking to coach and support and provide coordination. And this specifically will support our students, families, and staff. We know that it's not only our students and families who may have had impacts or some trauma through this pandemic, but so has our staff and we need to be sure that we're supporting them as well. And then throughout everything that we're doing, we know that we may need additional food service. We know that kids cannot learn if they're hungry and we need to make sure that we're supporting them uh, with nutrition as well. And then well, I'm already kind of mentioned, but uh, trauma-informed practices, professional development, continuing what we've already started this year and enhancing it and expanding it and going deeper with trauma-informed. So those are just some things that we brainstormed and gotten input from our administrative team, our site-based, our district office, as well as superintendent's council. Julia has met with our delight, which is our uh, de teacher leadership team. And then next step, as I mentioned, we'll be going out um, and getting more feedback from our staff at large and our parent groups at large. Any questions so far or about any of these items? Um, Marie yeah. here. Great. I was going to say, I think it'd be great to just kind of take a pause and hear from all the trustees on just kind of what's resonating with you or just to kind of let the staff hear a little bit about kind of what excites you about this. Um, so go ahead. Marie. The, um, so definitely very excited, excited to hear what you are gathering from the staff, uh, more than from myself uh, as, a, as an individual, but I want to hear what the staff recommends. And I was just wondering, so the the timeline to get that approved is before the end of June, right, Marcy? June 1. This oh, is June, June, June 1 is yes. 
we agree it's part. tomorrow so can you tell us a little bit more <laughs> in my head can you tell us a little bit more about how you are going to gather the the uh, feedback from the staff between yes. now and june 1st this is i'm just thinking it just goes so fast right now yeah absolutely so what we're going to be doing is julie and i are going to take these slides that we've just gone through yeah we're going to record ourselves presenting them and then we are going to send that out with a link to the recording and then do a uh, basically a Padlet where folks can add ideas and add comments and, and those kinds of things that they, they might have. So that will get pushed out. So that way a parent, a guardian, a staff member can view this at their own leisure. We'll just have a due date by the time that we need all of their input for consideration back. But we figure with everything going on, mm -hmm. uh, that's, the, that's probably the most um, efficient way to be able to have the most amount of folks be able to participate. Then, for example, if we did just a meeting where you would yeah. have to be on at that particular time. A lot of other school districts are doing surveys and things, mm -hmm. um, but what we wanted to also do is to be able to do a presentation to hopefully help people understand what these are all about and how they really are prescriptive and tied to, if we don't utilize the money and we put programs in place that aren't tied to any of those seven, or in our case, a total of five of those strategies, that will be a, an inappropriate use of the funding and we won't be able to use it that way. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be sure that we're following the prescribed uses that are set forth for each of the pots, regardless of whether or not they're pots that require um, input or not. Okay. Yeah. And and I believe some of the staff has also been involved in some of the meetings where this has been presented. Oh, yes, attendance mm -hmm. council and some and of those delight. others. So they so some people and delight. So they've they've gotten at least that head start. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, Rachel or Ryan or Wesley, have any initial thoughts or questions? Yeah, Rachel? it's Rachel. Um, I had I had a few thoughts because I know that we were talking about the money and how it has to be spent by a certain time and that it's one time funding. And so we have to make sure we're not jumping into something we can't support later on when people are expecting services. And I like the look of a lot of this because it looks like it's training, which people will take with them as teachers and to the next years. And so like the training has that effect. I was a little curious about the universal screening and the benchmarking, because that's something new. I haven't heard about that before. Um, and is that something that we've ever used before or is this something completely new for us as a district? So we have local benchmark assessments that we use. We use the F&P for kindergarten through fifth grade to look at reading fluency levels. We also use something called SRI starting in third grade going through eighth that again has to do with student reading levels. Um, we have math benchmark assessments that are created for each grade level and one for each trimester that are common throughout the district. So that is a benchmark assessment system but we're looking at the possibility of having something that's a little bit more formal um, and, and more targeted really for those key skills that we really know our kids are gonna need to keep moving forward um, and that will help us to identify where they need supports. Thank you. Great. And Wesley, I think you had, did you have? No, I just, that was me with my allergies. Okay. I was <clears throat> I also just wanted to say I really appreciate I know I know that this is a one time um, approach with funding, but as you mentioned Marcy about it really looking into a, a new normal it feels like it it's helping to do kind of a systems shift into that whole child multi tiered system of support approach that I think will have a long term like shift of the entire systems shift, even when the money is gone. And so I really appreciate taking that approach um, and looking at it in that very strategic way of how to take this money and invest it to kind of turn the rudder of the large system ship in that direction of, you know, social, emotional and academic learning so that learning is being seen as all three of those, not just one of those. Um, and along those lines, you had mentioned the multi-tiered system of supports, I know that's something that we were thinking of building that framework for the future and had mentioned something about the some of the staffing in that in the category around academic support staff, maybe like the instructional coaches, is some of the intention that while those uh, staff positions are gonna be doing kind of real-time support, they're also gonna be starting to build out the MTSS system 
at the same time? They're, they're absolutely part of it. And okay. so, you know, we have components of MTSS. White Hill definitely has a, an MTSS system in place there. And we want to make sure that we have a, a totally integrated TK through eighth grade. MTSS system to where, and typically, you know, school districts will use like a pyramid or something like that, or a joined pyramid. Um, and we'll also come up with something that is visual because that really helps to solidify. One of the things that I wanted to add related to any of the use of these one-time funds, some of these items here listed here, just as an example, um, intervention teachers or BACR counselors, more counseling staff. If for whatever any of the things that we implement put into place, they are absolutely critical to the continued ongoing education of our children. What we will have to do is then take a very critical look once the funding is gone to determine those elements are absolutely necessary in our Ross Valley schools. So as Jim Serretta, a former business manager always used to say, you can have anything you want, you just can't have everything you want. So <laughs> we'll be taking a close look at priorities and really determining, you know, if these need to stay and we can't afford everything, then how do we prioritize and strategically determine what stays and what needs to go of what we have currently. So um, we are not looking at this approach as a one and done, um, one time money and gone. It is really helping us to build this ship and to really look at the future of our Ross Valley schools and how all of our students are gonna thrive and have a joyous learning experience. Thank you. Ryan, did you have anything else that you wanted to? No, I like joyous learning experience though. <laughs> Great. Um, before, All right. Before we go on to the next slide, I did realize that what I wanted to say about, because I don't want to forget the VLA program, and I'd actually meant to cover that on a previous slide. I thought it was coming up. But in 21-22, we are looking at potentially needing to still offer a virtual learning academy for any students or families who aren't ready uh, to return to in-person learning. Um, but what we know is that the legal authority for distance learning opportunities is going to expire on June 30th, 2001, unless action is taken by the legislature and Governor Gavin Newsom to extend them. But in the absence of extending what we know has been allowed this year in a distance learning model. We know that there is an independent study option. It's right now in education code, it is accessible. Um, however, the way that it's supposed to look and be implemented right now looks very different than a virtual learning academy option. And so what we'll be looking at is monitoring um, how that progresses through and to see what any flexibilities there will be so that, because as of right now, our independent study program is where a parent requests it, must be under education code no less than five days. They sign a contract, an agreement that the student will complete the work under the designated amount of minutes that a teacher prescribes that must be completed in the independent study. And then the student gets a packet of work and completes it and turns it back in and then it gets signed off on. But that's really, that's independent study. It's not for the type of student who might need that additional support of a teacher to help them along the way, which is what VLA offers now for our students. The other thing um, that we know is the California School Boards Association, which represents board members from approximately 1,000 school districts. They're lobbying for schools to be able to continue to have the option of some kind of a distance learning program. Another thing that we know is what we're hearing in the news right now with California facing another potentially big season of wildfires and hence the harmful air quality. And we don't know what next school year is going to look like. Maybe it will be the end of the drought and maybe we'll have, unfortunately, a natural disaster such as a flood. What has been great about, you know, only one thing great about the COVID pandemic has been that we have been able to shift to remote types of learning experiences in which we have learning continuity. We haven't had to close our schools. We've been able to continue the learning. So what really needs to happen at the state level is that we have some, a variety of, of approaches and options to offer our students and families as well as to keep our schools open. Because what the state has been saying last prior to COVID closure is that when we had PSPSs and or the fires, is that we have been able to submit a waiver if we had to close our schools for one or two days. 
and the state would then grant us the opportunity to be funded. The state is saying no more. They're phasing out those waivers. So we don't know if we have to figure out a way to keep our schools operating in the face of a closure, whether it's an outbreak of COVID-19, it's a PSPS, it's a, a air quality, whatever it could be. We need to figure out ways to keep our schools going. And so with that, we also need to be supported. So I wouldn't be surprised if we do start to see some shifts and changes in the independent study um, laws around that. But that's what we'll be looking for. And as we get a little bit more of a sense that our enrollment for next year is a little bit more stabilized, we'll be uh, surveying our families to see if any of them do need a VLA option into next school year. And so we'll be working on to figure out a way in whatever the rules are around being able to operate it to provide the most robust system for the kids who must be in VLA. So um, that's what we're looking at too, which means that we would need to have additional funding in order to have teachers, for example, or supports for the kids in VLA. So that's why we do have it listed here as a potential use of the ELO funds. Alrighty, so I think I've covered everything and this takes us into the next section, which we're already starting to plan for summer. We can't wait until June 1st to see of our approved use. We have to start planning now. So Matt and Maria, um, our principal and assistant principal at White Hill are our summer school K-8 principals and they're working fast and furiously collaborating with other administrators and teachers to design the program. And Maria is here with us tonight, White Hill's uh -huh. assistant principal to talk about the planning so far. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we are calling it the RVSD Summer Climb Program. Very excited about that, a logo coming soon. Uh, we obviously just took it right off the RVSD site, the climb part. Um, we were looking for something and when we were looking, climb jumped out at us because we were picturing kids climbing or bridging a gap of, you know, kids who are completely disengaged. And it's not just an academic gap, but a, a gap of, of engagement. And um, so our one of our guiding principles, one of our main guiding principles is joyful re-engagement. Because really, if you think about these kids, kids were prioritizing to go to summer school, to the climb program, are the kids who have not, they're getting completely disengaged this year. And returning to full school next year will be a challenge. I mean, they haven't been there. So one of our main goals is getting kids emotionally ready to be present in the fall. We feel like if, if, they, if they have a positive summer experience at our climb program, they'll come in with a, a ready attitude in the fall and that would be a success if we achieve nothing else. Um, and we wanna do that through building relationships, making connections and just making it fun. With social emotional support, we wanna work social emotional support into the program through counseling and activities like community circles in the classes and mindful exer mindfulness exercises. And of course there is learning loss mitigation. Um, it's, it's not, all, <laughs> but we want it to be fun. We'll have English language arts, math is our focus for academics. But again, we see this as an opportunity for the teachers to try new things. Matt and I wanna encourage and support the teachers to um, experiment with new ideas, try some project-based learning. So the main guiding principles of summer climb program are relationships, engagement, and fun. And then logistics are June 14th to July 9th. That's 19 days. It's 18 days for the kids. June 14th is a teacher planning day. The kids would start the 18th, or 15th, sorry, 18 days. They would start June 15th. It's from eight to 12. It's invitation only. It's based on identified needs. The, the teachers and principals are currently kind of gathering lists, prioritizing them. And the students will be invited from a prioritized list. Um, starting with the highest priority, of course, an example would that be, like I said, just completely disengaged this year. That would probably be our highest priority. And we'll work up our list based on the number that we can support. Um, we'll hopefully we'll get as many as we can that we can support. Um, and again, the focus is readiness for next year through rela relationships, engagement, and fun. So and we're excited. And if we didn't say this, this is a district-wide program. It's not just a middle, it's just Matt and Maria happen to be the principals of the summer climb program. 
and it's it's a total integrated program kindergarten through eighth grades. Right. Any questions on the in initial planning of summer climb? This looks awesome. Thank you all for putting so much great thought and heart and soul into this, it shows. Marie here, that looks very joyful. This is, I think that's the point. Maria, is the K-8 program, is it all going to be run out of one campus or is it going to be K-5 somewhere and 6-8 at White Hill? What's your thought our, about that? Our thought right now is all one campus, White Hill. Oh. And, um, yeah, and so- Very joyful, uh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, we're excited. There's a huge field and we have a couple of PE teachers and- yeah. So we're excited. Awesome. Thank you. Very happy to hear that. I think it'll also be a great experience for the younger kids to be on that campus as a, as a place and get to see it and experience it. So that's also really very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And also to have the kids together because we know that yeah. older kids have the opportunity to make friends with, take care of younger kids. It helps boost them as well and gives them that sense of, um, of, um, knowing that they're caring for and helping another individual succeed. And so that, that community is really important to build that. And then I think that's it for summer climb. And then Eric, our director of student services is gonna talk about extended school year and the planning going on for that. Hi Eric, thanks for being with us. Oh, of course, I wouldn't miss it. Um, and I uh, put in my application to hopefully attend summer climb with Matt and Maria, because I think I would have a great time as a student. And I know I'd learn a lot. Um, special education uh, um, has as a, an IEP offering, as Marcy mentioned, um, extended school year ESY. Um, it's an IEP service um, and it's designed to ensure um, that more vulnerable students um, don't uh, experience regression over the summer months. Uh, after all the hard work, um, the 10 months of the school year, working on um, their academic goals um, and working um, with uh, their other areas of need. Um, so we were proud last summer, one of the very few programs in the county to have in-person ESY taught by, our, uh, taught by our very own Miss Sarah Hom in room 13, Brookside Elementary. And that was really powerful. And um, that was 10 students and we're um, very optimistic that we're gonna be able to support more students um, in ESY this summer. Um, so uh, why do we do ESY? We ensure students maintain progress on their goals, no summer slide. Um, we're working on building their confidence as learners um, and really helping them um, has, been, has been said tonight many times that self-perception um, and the self-image that students have of themselves is the very foundation um, that they take in to the classroom, out into society. Um, that is foundational and it's a big piece of it. Uh, continuity between school years, really helping them maintain that sense of momentum. Um, two months is a long time for you know, young kids. And so, um, and, and that continued connection with their teachers and staff is very powerful. And then also too, very critically, um, the teams are able to gather more data on their goals um, to determine how they're growing, what else they need. Um, and the dates are the same, June 14th through July 9th with July 5th as a holiday, um, seen as that a lot of people probably take it off anyway, it's a Monday, it's a four hour day. Um, and, uh, and we're also going to be really creative. There may be some students that um, are only able to come in for their related services like speech or OT, and we're going to do everything we can to get um, as much contact with our special ed students um, as we can over these four weeks of summer. So we're really proud of this program and incredible staff that's worked harder than ever all year who are super fired up to come in, you know, have this summer experience. So I'm feeling very grateful for that. Thank you, Eric. All right, and now the next slide is questions. So do you have any questions about any of tonight's um, schools reopening update number 17? I know you asked them as you went throughout. So maybe you're questioned out for now. 
I had a quick question about the ESY program for irrigating. Um, are those students from just Brookside campus or they, could they be from any of the other campuses as well? Great question. Um, they're from across the district. Um, we also have middle school students that qualify for it. And so I'll talk with uh, Matt and Maria about um, Maria about uh, if you know the best location for the the middle school program so we'll work that out um, uh, it was hosted at Brookside in the past um, because Brookside's kind of that central point of the district making sure that it's not too much of a hassle for families to get to um, and it is again available to students across the district uh, the caveat being that it needs to be a service in their IEP thank you All right. If there are not any other questions, then we will um, go on, which I think is a nice a nice pairing between <laughs> this update, uh, this specific update, and then our next presentation on the Healthy Kids Survey, um, which I think will dovetail, I'm assuming, nicely into this conversation around all the different ways that kids learn and all the different supports and what things that impact student learning. So looking forward to hearing the Healthy Kids Survey update. All right. We've been, we've been waiting for this. We've been hearing That's about right. it. That's we've been right. hearing we've about been it. <laughs> with bated breath um, and the last uh, public data that we have from Ross Valley's from 2015-16. So um, I'm immensely proud of the effort for our fifth grade and seventh grade teams, um, administrators, teachers, um, and parents who gave their consent um, to have our students take part in this. And I'm also super proud um, to have our colleagues from White Hill Middle, Autumn Arbery, Michelle Pelton, joining us. They are uh, the bedrock of the wellness program at um, White Hill Middle. And um, I'm going to uh, oh, if you wouldn't mind, Marcy, um, I will share my screen. Yep, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, it'll take it right over once you start to. Okay. Are you trying? Are you doing it? Uh, yeah, I, um, I'll, I'll stop. I don't have I'll to try. stop. Here we go. Though. Yeah. I okay. apologize. There we go. Let me try here. And there we go. Okay. Um, oops. Let's, we're kind of way in the presentation. We'll get there, folks. We'll get there. Um, let's get up to the first slide. My apologies. I want to give away the punchline there. I know. <laughs> I had some sort of sneakers in there. Um, the California Healthy Kids Survey um, that we just administered um, mostly in the, uh, well, late March through the month of April. Um, really proud to do that. Um, and so uh, tonight's presentation um, that I'm sharing with Autumn and Michelle, um, I just want to emphasize it really is the tip of the iceberg. The middle school report alone um, uh, for the seventh graders that took it is about 140 pages long. Um, the, the layers go very, very deep. We could be here hours and hours and hours um, looking at just one component of the survey. So I just wanna stress um, that this is our first public look. Um, we are doing a snapshot and we're really trying to capture the big picture and really how we can leverage this data to first of all celebrate um, the incredible things happening in our schools. And, and when you see some of these results, it is um, really humbling um, to think about what it's taken um, for our staff to generate that kind of energy um, from our students um, given the circumstances of this year. But then also too, there's very clear areas um, for continued growth and focus. Um, and we see this as an ongoing 
process of discovery. Um, and no way does any one survey ever capture all of it. So I just really want to start by saying that. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, um, and this, <laughs> I really do love how, um, you know, the talk about reopening schools um, and all the momentum that we're building into next year that, that we saw in our last presentation, um, that really is what this is about too. Wellness is the foundation for everything we do as educators, as a community. Um, and it isn't just for children, it's for the adults as well. We need to take care of each other, take care of ourselves. Uh, and we can learn and improve through ongoing feedback from students, staff, and community. That kind of transparency doesn't hurt us, it only helps us. Um, because if anything, we wanna make sure that people aren't hiding their struggles, um, that a kid isn't gonna keep it a secret or a family isn't gonna share with us when something's a problem. We want a culture of openness because then we can address it in the open. Uh, it, forget about a pandemic, we know that this is the case even in normal times. Um, so uh, it's measures like this, which are our big um, survey vehicles um, and the data from across the state, county, other districts, all of that's publicly available. But um, what matters is what we ultimately are able to do with it um, as a group of adults working together as a team, and that includes the parents as well. Um, so just a quick overview, um, these surveys uh, are driven by California Department of Education's, um, as it says here, a commitment to helping schools promote the success of cognitive, social, emotional, and physical development of all students and creating more positive, engaging school environments. Um, and these results inform our LCAP. Um, so it's really exciting um, to be able to look at something that's very holistic. Yes, there's information on the academic learning experience, but there's also information on uh, the, the school facilities and the cleanliness. There's uh, questions on bullying, on school safety, on racial sensitivity. Um, it breaks down student experience based on gender, based on race and ethnicity. Um, like I said, it really goes deep. <laughs> Um, but what you're going to see tonight again is um, more uh, of a summary of the big points. Um, this again is uh, it's easily found on the website. Um, there's a public link um, of the state dashboard for healthy kids. Um, not that we're about comparing ourselves with anyone else, but it is possible to see um, how our students um, and schools um, are faring on these different um, questions relative uh, to, to other um, areas throughout Marin, um, other areas throughout the state. And our current results won't be updated until November 2021. That process takes a bit. Um, so super quick, um, we employed a couple different survey modules. The core module for um, both fifth and seventh grade um, uh, gets into student connectedness um, that's a theme throughout this entire evening. Um, learning engagement and motivation and attendance. Um, for fifth grade, um, there was also the social emotional uh, health module and also the TUPI, tobacco use prevention education, which is a state requirement. So, you know, we start looking at what is the exposure our fifth graders have to drugs, alcohol, um, tobacco products. Um, which is very important for us to understand. Um, and then in addition to that in seventh grade, there was a, a school climate module. Um, and then the participation was really, really exciting. 72% um, of our fifth grade was able to um, uh, participate and that is with active parent consent. Um, and again, in a year where, you know, there's been just a lot of chaos and coming back to school and just all the, um, all that we've been managing. I really want to thank every fifth grade teacher, all the principals um, for taking time to do this and to the parents for supporting it. For the seventh grade, it's a passive consent um, and we had an 86% response rate. So kudos to the White Hill administration and teaching team um, to uh, get um, a vast majority of their students represented. And this is 
a full 20% of our entire district student body, um, which is a really robust figure, um, you know, when it comes to looking at our kids' experience. Um, all right, so we just, uh, again, quickly want to go over um, our fifth grade results. So we did separate it rather than do one big pot of all fifth and seventh grade results together. We thought it'd be good to separate by grade level. Now you see Miss Horky out in her outdoor classroom up at Hidden Valley um, doing math. I think that was the lesson of the day. Um, looks like fun to me. Um, so uh, digging in again, these are big picture, big picture items here um, in the core module. 79% of kids indicate staff care about them, listen to them, and make an effort to get to know them. 77% um, report that the schools take positive action to counteract bullying behaviors. And um, in saying that, um, the, the survey is indicating that's a strong positive indication. On a lot of questions, there's kind of like a don't really know, sort of like neutral. Um, so to get um, upwards of 80% positive um, for anything is pretty extraordinary. 82% um, of students indicate having a high degree of academic motivation. 90% of students report staff have high expectations and communicate positively about their successes. So not just, I expect you to do well, but messages of you can do well and I believe in you um, and so there's a lot of questions that are tailored very specifically to gauge how students feel and perceive staff support of their potential this is very powerful 82% um, of students indicate having a high degree of school connectedness and 91% of students indicate feeling safe at school again that we always want to see improvement there, um, that any time that you are uh, moving up into the 90% realm, um, there's a lot to be uh, excited about and proud of. Um, so I just want to show just a couple examples of what it looks like in the actual report. Um, uh, do you do things to be helpful at school? Meaning do you, this is sort of more of that school connectedness um, realm. And you can see um, a huge, hugely positive indicators. 4% of kids say no, never. Um, but the rest of kids, some of the time to all the time are looking to do things to be helpful. That's pretty cool. Um, so a very, um, a very uh, high degree of um, student engagement and helping out in their school settings. And really, you know, wonderful questions. They get right to the core and talk right to those little, you know, 10 and 11 year olds. Are you happy to be at this school? And the results there too, absolutely extraordinary. 80% of kids indicating a very vociferous yes. And of course, we always want to work to find those students that aren't feeling as positive. Um, but again, when we get survey results, it's not just about digging out where the problems are, but also let's identify our successes. And I hope every teacher and staff member uh, that sees this, uh, I hope they feel a sense of ownership and pride in, in what this is showing us. A um, couple more questions um, before moving on to the older kids. Do the teachers and other grown-ups give you a chance to solve school problems? I love this question. And this is exciting. So, you know, basically 90% of kids are saying, yeah, to some degree, we get a chance to, you know, kind of think on a bigger school level. It's very cool. Um, and, and then more kind of in that realm of climate and conflict resolution. Um, does your school help students resolve conflicts with one another? Um, lots of positive feedback there. Um, does your school teach students to understand how other students think and feel this perspective taking? Such a huge, such a huge skill in life. Um, and something that if we want our kids to take away any skill uh, from their public education, you know, this is up in the top three. Um, and again, really extraordinarily positive results. Um, so uh, more, I think, exciting um, information that we're getting on um, the culture across our four elementary schools. Um, and now moving into the drugs, alcohol, and, and tobacco exposure. Um, zero students in this particular survey reported having smoked a cigarette or vaped in the last 30 days. So 
I take that as being a positive. And then interestingly too, and again, I'm cherry picking here a little bit, but 22% report having had one or two sips of alcohol in their lifetime. So I think that, you know, what we're seeing and what we kind of know from being parents and educators is that, you know, this is kind of the age as you're sort of approaching middle school where that exposure to drugs, alcohol, tobacco, um, things of that nature is, is starting to kind of emerge a bit. And so of course our job as a public institution is to meet that moment with education, um, with support um, and making sure that, that our kids um, are having the opportunity to, to feel supported um, and to know that, uh, you know, that they're not alone in this journey into young adulthood. Um, and having worked at our uh, local wonderful high school, uh, now named Archie Williams High School, um, formerly Drake, um, of course we know that that effort to continue educating kids doesn't stop once they leave Ross Valley schools. Um, this is the last thought that I'll share for the elementary schools. Again, tip of the iceberg, 90% um, of students report feeling thankful to go to their school. Um, so, um, what we're going to do, and uh, Michelle and Autumn are going to dig into the middle school survey results, um, is as a faculty, um, really take time to analyze and look at um, areas of strength and areas of, of needed attention um, uh, with uh, this survey and also to, of course, involve our parent community um, in generating solutions and also continuing uh, so many of the great things we see reflected here. Um, okay, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Autumn and Michelle. There you see a beautiful panorama of White Hill Middle uh, at full throttle. Autumn, okay. Michelle, thank you so much. Just tell me when to advance okay. and I will. Sure. Yeah. So just a little history about California Healthy Kids Survey. It looks at the climate, it looks at safety and student wellness. And then you look at the resiliency of the kids by looking at the questions. So our job is to really just analyze the data that's, that's being presented. And we look at the health risks, we look at the behaviors, and, and then we look at the school connectedness that we have, the school climate and the overall well-being of the students. So as Julia put it earlier, it's seeing the kids for who and where they are. And this is a, a nice instrument for that. So when we look at the seventh grade results, I'm gonna have Eric, let's hit the next slide. We're gonna look at 71% indicate that staff care about them, listen to them and make an effort to get to know them. I think that's really good um, indicator for our kids. The 67% of students report having a high degree of academic motivation. So again, we're looking at 219 students out of 254 uh, for seventh grade. And then the next screen is 82% of students report that staff have high expectations and communicate positively about their successes. That's a really great number to see. And 61% of students have difficulty maintaining focus on their schoolwork. I think this is really indicative of the position that they've been in, being you know, at home and distant learning and then coming back to school and hybrid. And so they've had so much transition. There has been trauma with some of the students. It's, um, it's something that support all the way around is needed. So we'll go to the next screen, Eric. So school climate, 87% of students state that they feel safe in school. This is a really great number. Um, my background is working in Vallejo Unified and Richmond School District, and our numbers were never this high for a California Healthy Kids survey. And oftentimes the questions related towards gang violence and a lot different atmosphere. So we live in a really beautiful place and the kids appreciate where they are. So that's really wonderful. 79% of students believe that school staff would help them if they experience bullying. That's something to be proud of. I'm going to jump in here about the social emotional well being. Um, we're seeing that 79% of our students state that they have strong peer connections at school. So they feel like they have friends who that they who they can reach out to and talk to about their problems. 
And we know that trusted adult relationships are super important, but at this age, having peer relationships is also really, really important to their overall well being. 85% um, of students report high feelings of self efficacy. So they trust, they have trust in themselves, trust that they know where to go when they're experiencing problems, that they have faith that they can work out their problems. 68% of our students report feeling optimistic about their future. Then we do have 7% of our students reported serious suicidal ideations in the past um, 12 months. That's like Michelle had said previously indicative of where we are, but this is an alarming number. We, we can see that there's about 15 students and you know that's something that Michelle and I take a look at and it's one of the biggest areas of focus for us when we're looking at this data, along with the 25% of our students who report chronic levels of hopelessness and or sadness. 60% um, of our students report healthy coping mechanisms and problem solving skills. And so that is very exciting to see because we want our students to know that when they have these feelings, how do they handle them and where do they go? So those are the biggest things that we focus on when we're looking at the data. And then we did have a bit of a breakdown by um, race and ethnicity. And so when we were talking about the, the trauma informed approach and the number one productive factor being adult supports, we wanna make sure that all of our students are, are seeing and feeling like they have adult support. So we can see that our Hispanic and Latinx population reported 81%, um, our white population 94, and our mixed uh, two or more reported 90%. So those are high levels all around, but ones that we want to focus on. And then drug and alcohol use, 3% of our students reported using marijuana, 5% um, any of the above. That is rather low numbers, which is great. And then when we're looking about with areas of growth and concern, we want to continue that emphasis on trusted adult relationships. We want to increase our efforts to include and engage BIPOC and Latinx students and families and a focus on staff wellness. And we additionally want to make sure that we're reaching those students who are um, experiencing the chronic levels of sadness and hopelessness. Um, so one thing too that, that is really extraordinary and having come from a middle school setting the last six years is it's natural even from sixth to eighth grade to see survey um, results come back a, a little bit less positive um, as <laughs> the age goes up. Sixth graders are all hugs and oh, we love everybody. Um, and eighth graders might be a little bit more guarded. Um, but to see those kinds of uh, results for seventh grade you know, which is, I think, universally recognized to be a real pivotal transitional year, you know, really kind of that, that shift from childhood to young adulthood is really powerful. Um, so um, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who's California's first ever Surgeon General, um, sums all this up perfectly, and not just our presentation, but I think the one uh, previous stars as well. Trusted relationships are the number one antidote to stress and adversity. Um, and of course, our charge as public educators is to generate a climate in every, every one of our schools where students can experience that with each other and with our staff. And, and because we're human beings too, it feels good for us as adults to have those trusting relationships with each other as professionals and with our community partners and parents. Um, because we need to make sure that we're helping our fellow adults um, be a little bit happier um, and a little bit lighter on their feet after an incredibly taxing year plus. Um, gauging the student experience throughout the year is really, really key. Um, and I just, I want to um, give my immense respect and kudos to what the White Hill team has done, not at the end of the school year. You know, this is, this is cool to look at in May, but all year, the weekly check-ins that they've been doing, those students that are having suicidal ideations or experiencing chronic sadness, they've uh, discovered who some of those students are um, because they're doing those proactive check-ins um, in their advisories. Um, they're 
making sure that uh, every single week there's mechanisms by which students can reach out for support. Um, the community circles is a powerful model um, that they're going to continue suicide prevention lessons, um, anxiety and coping skills lessons. And then also too, something that we're gonna focus on as a district is not just doing the healthy kids survey in the spring, but, but smaller, more localized surveys that really target um, how, how we're doing. You know what, and our first one should be coming in October because after two months of school, it's a great time to be checking in to see how we're doing. We don't want it to just be at the end of the year. Um, and Autumn, Michelle, I want you guys to talk a little bit about this. Sure. Well, the one thing to recognize is, it, like Eric had put, it's collaboration. And as you can see, we have programs in place at our school level, but there's also programs in place that are not only at our, at our MCOE, the Marin County Office of Education, and Marin County to also be involved in. So when you look at the continued trauma-informed practices work by Autumn, she did a great job and had two staff meetings. I don't know, Autumn, do you want to touch on this some more? Um, I mean, I think it's been touched on, but I think that it, it's a huge factor when we're moving into the next school year. We need to acknowledge that our staff, students, and families have experienced a trauma, and that may or may not present itself. You know, trauma tends to, <clears throat> sorry, trauma can wait up to three to five years before it shows itself. So we wanna continue that work. It is very important. Yeah. Um, and thank you for recognizing it as a strategy mm -hmm. and working with our kids this next year. Um, and, and also too in the realm of parent education, um, because again, uh, learning and living doesn't stop when the school day is over. Um, why don't you uh, share uh, this, this first one um, with Annie Egan. She was fantastic. She came to us. She's the founder of the Worth and Wellness. Mm -hmm. um, and she presented Is It Normal? Adolescent Development Through the Middle School Years and kind of really helped um, lay out to parents expectations of middle school years and how to best support their kids positively so that they build relationships and trust so that they can they can be there to support their kids when they really need it. It was a fantastic um, presentation. It was very exciting to be be there. Wonderful. Um, and then something there'll be uh, details to come, but there's a, a group of um, middle schools um, in Southern Marin, and that's going to include White Hill Middle School, of course, um, are going to uh, come together for a parenting webinar. Um, uh, with a, a very well-known um, speaker, author, um, and parenting expert. And that's going to be in the early fall, potentially late August, early September. Um, details are still being worked out, but of course, there'll be a big communication campaign. Um, and it really is targeting middle school. Um, the challenges there are quite unique. Um, and especially in these, what I would say, fragile times, as we you know move back to quote-unquote normalcy, we understand as Autumn says, that um, we're all carrying a lot of weight. Our kids are carrying trauma. Um, and so rather than just fast forward to let's just be back to pretending like it's all right again, um, we need to be attentive um, and mindful. Um, uh, so also something too that um, we did as a district uh, back in February, and of course it was a bit different. You know, we hadn't fully um, gotten back to five day a week uh, school. Uh, the Global School Play Day, which started right here in Marin County, is a day a year dedicated to unstructured play. And if you remember back from Julia talking, um, it is something that uh, Linda Darling Hammond on our State Board of Education, um, a researcher, author, um, understands as you know, one of the foundations of good learning is uh, play. And the Global School Play Day team surprised the world um, by saying that there's going to be actually a September edition. Um, so that date is to be determined. Um, but the idea is to help schools around the world um, get the school year started um, with celebration um, and really helping build that sense of community. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, um, but this is from um, a paper from the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2019. And I'm just gonna read to you one line. 
Uh, furthermore, play supports the formation of the safe, stable, and nurturing relationships with all caregivers that children need to thrive. Um, so <clears throat> um, when we look at all of these different avenues of support in the classroom, uh, out on the playground, out in the community, um, we know um, that play is something that um, is a through line. Um, and we just really want to thank uh, our trustees, um, our superintendent, um, who has so robustly um, and energetically gotten behind all these endeavors um, to focus on the whole child um, and wellness first, because we know that that's what's essential. Um, and um, we promise as a team to share further reflections on um, the immense trove of data from this Healthy Kids survey um, uh, as we move into the fall, because we still have a lot to learn from it. Um, and if our trustees have any questions, we will we will uh, be happy to engage. Marie here. I have a comment and a, and a question. My, the first comment, and I want to thank uh, the YT team again for having organized that parenting session with Annie. Again, that was just out of this world. It was so good. I did it twice, one with the high school and one with the middle school. That was definitely, uh, although that was not exactly the same program, but absolutely, thank you for doing that. It was very helpful. Um, and I look forward to see a little bit more of the uh, trend of the survey to see what it was like last time we administered. I, I know that the, uh, in general, that, that data, we have it in fifth, seven, nine, and 11th grade, and we follow the cohort. This time, because we kind of let drop last year, we won't be able to follow the cohort, but I still want to see how, it would be interesting to see how our current seventh grader uh, are feeling as opposed to the seventh grader three years ago, just to kind of, on, not on everything, but on a couple of those kind of key engagement and happiness and joy uh, metrics to make sure we are, we are celebrating rightfully, not just because they are high, because they might have been even much higher before, they might have been bad. Just kind of, I want to look into that. Not, not, not right now, uh, but that's something that I would be interested in hearing more about. Thank you. And I noticed on one of the slides, it said that the data was going to go up on November. Is that when the live link in November? Not so, not until November. But yeah. okay. Yeah. A lot of the, a lot of districts have not even um, administered that survey quite yet. I know that for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But we won't say who. No. <laughs> <laughs> any other any other questions from any I of the trustees? I, I just wanted to thank you for a, such a comprehensive presentation. I really appreciate a lot of time and efforts going into it. Thank you. I um, am hoping that we can maybe take this recording and have it on our website. It'd be great for other people who might not have been able to be here tonight, parents and others to go back and reflect on it and know uh, that it's been done and some other results because it is very appreciative that this is being done. And as people hear about it, they might wanna, oh, wait a minute, I missed that. And I'd like to hear more about that. So um, hopefully, I know we've done that with some of uh, the other presentations, but it would be nice maybe to put this one up as well. Thank you. Great. I've made a note of that. I'll talk with Sean tomorrow. And just want to thank you so much, Autumn, Michelle, and Eric, for the presentation tonight and for coming and all of the work that you do to ensure that all of our students at White Hill are safe and healthy and that whatever needs they have are being addressed. So that comprehensive approach that you all take there is wonderful. It's truly supportive of the kids. And I know that they're getting good care. Thank you. You're here. What a fun bunch, by the way. I really enjoyed it before the recording. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, let's keep 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 rolling here. We've got item number three in our presentations, and thank you all so much for being here. And um, we'll just. We've got consent and business. Now we've got our consent and our business and all that kind of stuff. It's not nearly as um, engaging, and but it's definitely as important. Um, just a little bit of a different topics. So let's move on to the presentation, which is the recommended approval of declaration of need for fully qualified educators. Marcy, can you, I believe yep. you're the one that's going to be telling us about this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Salinas is um, out of the district. Uh, her daughter is graduating from college, so she is off celebrating that a momentous event. And so the declaration of need 
is it's an annual requirement that if any district needs to hire a teacher who is not, or some other faculty member who is not fully credentialed, they might be an intern, they're working on a credential, they may be out of state trained and haven't yet met the California requirement for English language learner certification, that um, having this declaration of need on file at the state level with the CTC, California Commission on Teacher Credentialing, allows us to be able to hire folks who may not yet be fully credentialed. And so this is just a standard practice that we go through every year, um, just so that in the event that we have openings that we are not able to fill with fully credentialed teachers or faculty, that this file, this declaration being on file with the CTC allows us to go ahead and employ and get those folks on any kind of a permit. So um, this action tonight is asking you to please approve the declaration of need for the 21-22 school year. Any questions? Any other questions? No? If there are none, we can go ahead and entertain a motion to approve. Move Brian. Brian moves. I no, second please. Marie. Okay. Wesley, sorry, Marie, beat you to that one. <laughs> You're usually pretty fast though, Wesley, but this time Marie got. All right. So we've got Ryan and Marie with a motion and a second, and we'll go ahead with the vote. Ryan? Aye. And Marie? Aye. Wesley? Aye. Rachel? Aye. And Shelly? Aye. Okay, we have approved the declaration of need. Um, we are now moving on to our consent actions. Um, we have five consent actions on the consent agenda. Um, is there anyone who has any questions or clarifications on any of those items before we do a single motion on them? Nope, I'm not hearing any going once, going twice. Okay, so then we will go ahead and um, open it up to a motion. I'll move consent. All right. Second, Ryan. All right, so we've got motion and consent. And we'll vote. Wesley? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Marie? Aye. And Shelly? Aye. All right. Moving on to our board business, committee updates and reports from trustees. Are there any, I know this is kind of a back-to-back -back meeting, so we probably uh, don't have anything. We don't have any. Rachel, Rachel, you didn't attend three meetings in the last three days? <laughs> You've been really busy, no? Not this week. <laughs> MCOE meetings. <laughs> yes. Wesley or Ryan? Uh, yep. Nothing from Wesley. None. All right. Uh, then we don't have any. Then we'll move on to the approval of meeting minutes for May 4th. Are there any uh, um, adjustments, edits? Yeah. On I page, had a few. Uh, okay. On page one, uh, Marie and I were in attendance, uh, and it says that. Um, that we weren't, uh, ah. so if, uh, I moved to Orly and then that. Okay, so we've got that. Rachel, did you have another? Yeah, it's super right. minor. On my, um, on my, gosh, what number is it? It's on the board business. Mm -hmm. When I was giving a summary about the safe routes to school, there was a traffic study, not a traffic student. <laughs> so if somebody was reading this, it wouldn't have made any sense. <laughs> Thank so, you. That's all. It always see if uh, it's you know what those are always worth doing because it means we're reading through them so i appreciate every uh every bit on that it's always good anything else all right teresa did you get those amendments so we basically have two amendments one is uh the inclusion of wesley and marie and the other was the amendment from student to traffic study any question i got it great just want to make sure to capture those I'll go ahead and move consent as amended, or rather right. not consent. Approval. Uh, I'll move the approval of the minutes as amended. Thank you. So we have a motion to approve as amended. Second it. With a second by Rachel and we'll vote. Wesley? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Ryan? Aye with the traffic student. <laughs> and Marie? Aye. And Shelly? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Cabinet Report. All right. Updates, Marcy. Thank you so much. Um, 
Chris, do you happen to have any updates tonight from the business department or I don't, I don't have any this evening. Thank you. And Julia, do you have anything to add? I do. I have very exciting news. Um, so White Hill <laughs> this year had six students who advanced to the National History Day competition. Whoa. Um, and they went to the state level. The theme for National History Day this year is communication and history, the key to understanding. And this is the third year that White Hill students have been participating in National History Day. Um, and it's just amazing what these kids are doing. And so this year, the students who advanced were students of the fabulous teachers, Bianca Pierce and Amelie Tao, um, who mentored these kiddos, but also of course, built on the work from the previous year that Bianca Vidal and Amanda Wagner, um, our seventh grade history teachers had done with our students. So for the group exhibits, um, both we had two projects that advanced to the state finals um, that went into the final round. And those two projects, the first one was called The Chance to Choose, How the Communication of Roe v. Wade Changed Women's Reproductive Rights. And that uh, project was from Samantha Devoren and Frankie Sandusky. And then we had a second group exhibit that also advanced to the, to the finals. Um, and that was Roe v. Wade, how Roe's argument communicated the rights of pregnant women. Um, and this one came from Caroline Lozaw and Talia Hadar. And then there were two individual exhibits, exhibits that also went to the state level. And these were from Isabella O'Brien, who studied the Chernobyl disaster, the result of miscommunications in nuclear power use. And then also one from Ella Ferrucci, which was Fights for Rights, Bloody Sunday, and the Struggle for Black Suffrage. So hats off to our historians at White Hill Middle School. Pretty awesome. Wow. Fantastic. That is great. Right. Is, there, is there any way to see those? Like, is there a link or something that we could... Uh... Yes, I just got them today and I was going to reach out to their teachers and see if we could actually even link them right onto our website under curriculum. Um, yeah. People could just take a look. And it was a virtual conference and they're kind of neat. They're like virtual trifolds um, that you can oh. take a look at. So Very cool. Yeah, coming. Thanks. Thank you for bringing that up. Sure. All right. Thank you. And Eric, anything from student services to add? No additional reports from student services tonight. All right, thank you. And from superintendent's office, um, all the sites are busy planning their promotion and or graduation um, events this year. The guidelines are very, very strict as to how to hold them. Um, and so it will they will definitely look different than they've ever looked in any previous year. But um, the sites did um, get family or parent input uh, from eighth and fifth graders to help get a sense of what it was they were looking for. And overwhelmingly, um, the interest was on in-person events. So that's what the sites are planning on. And we all here at the DO, maintenance and operations, technology, as well of, as, well as all of us in the DO will be there to support the sites. Um, in past events, uh, the superintendent, for example, or other district office administrators may have sat in the audience and celebrated the promotees. Um, but this year, because we know that uh, there needs to be a lot of staff to help support all of the schools, that's going to be our focus, is really letting the students, the school staff, and their families celebrate the promotees and the graduators. And so um, we're going to be there to support. And then, of course, being there, we'll get to witness and, um, and help to celebrate their accomplishments and off to the next level that they'll all be going. And then we've also been very busy um, working on interviewing for our Wade Thomas principal position. And so um, we're hopefully going to be wrapping that up soon. Um, did a great amount of input gathering from our second level interview panel yesterday. And, um, and so finishing those last details up to ensure that if we are successful with this round, that we have somebody to recommend to you. Um, I know that we set aside a, um, a potential date of this Thursday for a special board meeting. I'm in the event and I won't know yet. I don't know at this moment if we're gonna be successful or not. We may need to move it to um, next week. Just wanted to make sure we go through all the paces and ensure that we are ready to um, recommend uh, that the board approve uh, the superintendent's recommendation for that. So I think that's about it. Um, it's just been 
a wonderful ride in terms of getting through this school year and then super energizing and exciting looking forward into the future. So it's just nonstop fun and action. Well, you thank you for all of <laughs> all of your positive energy riding these waves of of uh, change and adaption and just staying so positive and energetic is very much appreciated and noted and acknowledged and thank you for that Marcy and all of the staff all of the staff um, in all of our sites and the DO so absolutely yep. yeah happy to, happy to do it okay so I think all right so then we can we will be moving now into our closed session um, we have two items um, we'll be recessing into our closed session I I uh, learned today on that MCOE training that we are not adjourning into the closed session. We are recessing into the closed session. <laughs> and and uh, take a note of some language we need to modify. H6, it talks about adjourning from closed session. We will there you go. That, uh, from their future agendas and just simply have reconvene in open session. Exactly. Reconvene yep. in open session. Um, I did notice, though, in the training today that we were, we're doing pretty good on all of the way that we move in and out of things, given what we were trained on. So Absolutely. we've got we got two items, conferencing with our labor negotiators um, and public employee evaluation, items four and five. I don't believe, do we have any uh, comments on this item? Yeah. No, we do. Okay. So we don't, and we will then recess into closed session. Okay, and what we're going to be doing for this part, as always, when we recess into closed session is to pause the recording. Um, and then we will resume recording when we come out. But our live stream portion, since we do not have um, anything remaining on the agenda for today, except other than adjournment, um, we won't be live streaming uh, once we go into closed session. We will just resume recording when we come out. All right. We are, it's 9-11. And we are conve reconvening in open session. And um, the two items that we had in closed session were discussion items. And there's uh, nothing, no decisions to report out of those closed items. And we can then move on to our final meeting review topic about future board topics and board direction. Um, Marcy, I think you were going to give us a little preview of kind of what things we have coming up to close out the year. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. We do have um, two um, regularly agendized or calendared uh, meetings for the remainder of the year, June 1st and June 14th. And we do have a lot. They're going to be action packed um, coming up. So as we heard earlier this evening under our um, schools reopening update, we have to do our e ELO spending plan. And that'll um, be on June 1st, it has to be approved on or before. And then we'll have our LCAP the public hearing and approval. So a public hearing at one meeting and then the approval at the next. And then our 21-22 budget adoption. So that will also be a two-step. So 6-1 and 6-14 for both of those. And uh, just in terms of the order, the um, budget adoption must occur on the agenda prior to LCAP. And then we will have a retiree recognition. We do have a couple this year. So we'll be looking forward to celebrating mm -hmm. them. And then um, we have the manor SIPSA or single plan for student achievement. And that will be on the 6-1 meeting. And then uh, looking forward to uh, meeting to schedule a special board meeting. And we're looking at next Tuesday, um, beginning at 6 p.m. And that would be, uh, we're able to, I'm able to recommend um, employment of a new Wake Thomas principal to you all. And so I think that's it on the horizon. Anybody have any other topics or anything uh, that you're thinking of? Of course, we'll have our standing items of consent and you know all those types of things again. Yeah, that are major. And then, and then remind me over the summer, what is our what is the normal cadence? Or those of you that have been on the board for a while, the cadence over the summer and then setting the new cadence for the next year. Oh, that's right. We haven't we, done our calendar setting, did we? Have we done that? I don't think we've yes. done our I for the next we, year. Did we approve a calendar for next year? Well, we should I will look into it. Yes. Okay, sure. I and think it, so. 
I think we did too. I but, think we um, did that maybe in January or early February. Like it seems to me that we've done that because I was checking dates for me to go potentially in, you know, in, in France or something. So I looked into that. Okay. Okay. So in my, in my head, we have done it, but I could be wrong. I would, I would rely on Rachel who knows more about those kind of details than me. Rachel, you, you think we've done it? I, I thought we had two because I entered everything into my okay. phone. Yeah, exactly. I think I, me too. But I think I have. I know updates. we did the board meetings, but now I'm wondering if it was a school calendar. Yes. Well, um, we will look into it, and if we <laughs> did not do that yet, that will come before you on June one. And then, if we did do it, then I will be sure to have uh, Teresa do calendar invites for you all. And get them the ca calendars. Calendar invites are awesome when she when Teresa does that. So that'll be okay. great, great if they're not there. All right. Any other questions about future? I have, the, I have the board meeting of my calendar. So it might just be me, but okay. I have some. So let's look into that. But yeah, okay. I'll look in my files too. Any other meeting uh, debrief thoughts or questions? Nope. Other than we were talking about, you know, presentations that have kind of back and forth on presenters kind of keeps it you know, exciting and entertaining, uh, especially for the longer ones. So just feedback for, for staff. And it's great to hear. I re it's great. I really appreciate, uh, Marcy, when, when we get to hear from lots of the different staff in different parts of the district and from different schools. And so just continuing for any of the longer presentations to have those different voices, um, both communicating and presenting as well as for us and the community to kind of get to know and see um, all the different staff that are out there supporting all of our students. Absolutely. And I have, uh, remind me, uh, Marcy and Shelley, uh, the, we are not going back to in-person board meeting for this school year. It would be for next school year because you have not yet uh, gotten Done information about it, yeah. exactly. So that we are not so moving waiting. for the next couple of uh, meetings. Yeah, we don't have any, yeah, Marcy and I wanna wait and see what that's mm -hmm. gonna, what we're gonna learn before we kind of set the, the plan Perfect. forward. Perfect, okay, so. thank you. Okay, nothing else then. Uh, we can, I will then adjourn. I'm looking at making sure I have it. <laughs> I will adjourn the meeting, it is 9.16. Get that time down and um, meeting is adjourned.